I want to conclude today my series on Thomas Jefferson, one of the five subjects of my uh, Prager University series on the making of America. And I want to begin by talking not about Jefferson, but about Martin Luther King, because in his famous 1963 speech, the I Have a Dream speech, Martin Luther King talks about submitting a promissory note. And he says, I, I want this note to be cashed. And I've often thought to myself, what note? What's he talking about? Did somebody give him a note? Did the Southern segregationists sign a note uh, that King is now demanding that they live up to? And the answer is no. King is actually not talking to them. They didn't give him a note. He's referring to the Declaration of Independence. That's the promissory note. And ironically, that promissory note was written not by some civil rights activist, not by some black guy fighting for freedom. It was written by a white guy. Uh, a Virginia planter, a fairly large-scale slave owner, Thomas Jefferson, and um, this is a this raises, if you will, the Jefferson conundrum. The Jefferson conundrum is just this: uh, How is it the case that a Virginia planter? How is it the case that a man who owned a couple of hundred slaves nevertheless insisted that all men are created equal? Uh, for the left, this is blatant hypocrisy. For the left, it shows, uh, if you will, the inadequacy of Jefferson. Didn't that man even recognize what he was saying and how blatantly it contradicted what he was doing? And how would he allow an America to get started? And this would be an indictment of all the American founders uh, who condemned slavery while at the same time supposedly, apparently, allowing it. Now, of course, the puzzle of Jefferson is that Jefferson did condemn slavery, and he did it in the cadence of a biblical prophet. He said things like, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. He said, the Almighty has no attribute, no attribute, uh, which can take side with us in such a contest, meaning the slave owner and the slave. And uh, he even said uh, that he was hoping for conditions to provide for what he called a total emancipation under the auspices of heaven. So here's Jefferson really demanding and longing for the end of slavery. And yet he, to some degree, allows it uh, and is, in fact, also a practitioner of it. How could the man, and here's Jefferson, by the way, writing from the summary view of the rights of British America. This is um, 1774, two years before the Declaration. Uh, this is Jefferson speaking for himself, not speaking for the country. But he says, and this is a phrase that Lincoln loved to quote and was very influenced by. Jefferson says, the abolition of domestic slavery is the great object of desire in those colonies, meaning all the colonies, where it was unhappily introduced in their infant state. So here's Jefferson using the word abolition. And he's saying the colonies want to get rid of slavery. And you might say, well, why don't they just get rid of it? Well, Jefferson's point is that slavery came to America, and we're sort of reminded of this by the 1619 Project. Slavery begins in 1619, but Jefferson goes, think about it. We've had slavery from 1619 to 17, that's 150 years. That's the distance um, if you if you work your way 150 years back, and we 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 would be close to the American founding itself. So Jefferson's like this institution has become embedded in American life. This is why Jefferson says, in a famous phrase, "We have a wolf by the ear, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go." Now. In studying the Declaration of Independence, a lot of times people focus on the first part of it, all men are created equal, and they stop there, as if the, as if the sentence ends there and there's no sentence that follows it that is intricately connected with the sentence, but there is, there's a second phrase. And, and when we, we focus on the second phrase, we begin to understand the tension between the two. So the second phrase is that governments derive their legitimacy from, quote, the consent of the governed. This is the democracy principle. So if all men are created equal is the equality principle, there is an equality principle in the declaration, there's also a democracy principle. Now here's the, the, the question. What happens when the two contradict each other? Or to put it differently, what happens when a majority of people in a society democratically refuse to give their consent to the idea that all men are created equal? What do you do then? 
And the progressives will say, well, no problem. We just uh, run roughshod over them. We just uh, ignore them and we pass laws that uh, outlaw slavery. And Jefferson's question would be, wait, what? We're trying to establish a democratic country. Are you telling me that we should kill democracy in its cradle? We should shut down democracy before it even gets started? We should take the majority of the will of the American people and disregard it and create a constitution that then has to be ratified by the states that they're not going to ratify. But leaving that aside, the point is we are going to try to establish a universal principle of equality while undermining the democracy that is also an expression of equality and of the will of the American people. So Jefferson's point is no, what we actually have to do is something more complex. This is the philosophical statesmanship of Jefferson. We have to reconcile equality with consent. Now Lincoln understood this and Lincoln in a sense realized that his was the time 80 years later when this could in fact be done. And that's why Lincoln says very famously that the founders declared the rights that could not in fact have been implemented at their time. Why? Because there was no popular consent for them. So the founders declared the right whose enforcement must follow, Lincoln said, as soon as the circumstances permit. I'm obviously quoting from memory, but it's very close to the original. Lincoln is, Lincoln found a way in his time to reconcile equality with popular consent. And in that sense, Lincoln realized the Jeffersonian vision. And think about it, from the, from the um, civil rights uh, movement in the 1960s, all the way back through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, equality of rights under the, all of this has been based on the original Jeffersonian principle. He was a flawed man, but this in no way undoes, un, this in no way undermines his greatness, which is not in dispute. It was Jefferson's note that Lincoln cashed, and Frederick Douglass cashed, and Martin Luther King too. And what these men did together, the men who implemented Jefferson's vision, is that they, they knew that Jefferson created the pathway for America to become a better country in these respects than it was at the beginning.